بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Okay, so let me continue uh, some aspects of that. It will allow me to highlight some of the things I was going to talk about earlier uh, that I plan to talk about a bit later. That is, so this issue of theft. <coughs> now, this is something that still requires a lot of deliberation and a lot of ulama have actually and written about this, that what constitutes theft what type of amount constitutes theft? What is the exact nature, socioeconomic background, income level of the person who is committing that theft? How protected, even this is something that Ulama looked at, how mafuz, how protected is that they stole? And if it wasn't properly protected by the original owner or guardian, that may also take it out of the realm of theft. May take it into the realm of misappropriation. There's also another category in Sharia called ghasab. Uh, which is, you know, to usurp or misappropriate something. Uh, then there are all types of modern type of theft, sort of an e-commerce type theft. So these are, it's a living tradition, and there's a living scholarly tradition on this. And, you know, a lot of these things, actually, that I mentioned would actually not fall under uh, the had punishment of cutting off the hand. Now that I've mentioned that, I also want to say that there's another aspect in Islam, hadood punishments, so the hudud are those, had means the border, the line that Allah Ta'ala Himself has demarcated and determined. So those are the, in terms of Islamic criminal law, those punishments that are stipulated by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in Qur'an Al-Kareem, those are known as hudud punishments. Even for them, the Islamic juristic tradition did understand a context. So like I told you, it's not that uh, the classical position is that there's no context. We accept that there's context. We will understand the context. Context will affect our application today. But there will always be a universe, universality to the Quran al -Karim. Never be exclusive or particular or restricted to that context. Because if you say that, that's actually abrogation. That's actually doing nasq or abrogating an ayah. Okay? However, one of the things that the ulama today, in the past as well as today, is the context of that verse was, and it's something I mentioned to you yesterday in light of apostasy law, is that you can do it. I remember when I was doing the quote unquote Mufti course in Karachi, I actually asked my teacher this question pertaining to the Women Protection Bill and Hudud Ordinance. That came a bit later, but the Hudud Ordinances that were in Pakistan. And he accepted to me because I had also read it and I asked him about it. He accepted that the Had punishments in Islamic criminal law are only enacted as the final step in the enactment of Islam. The social laws, economic laws, moral society, welfare, justice, all of those things have to be in place first. And then will you legislate the hudud punishments? So that would be another thing that would play a role in whether a thief's hand would be cut off. So it's a very complex matter in the realm of Islamic law. That said then, just to continue and share with you my discussion with him at that time, I asked him that why did the ulama then insist on the hudud ordinances given that all the conditions that you were agreeing that the medieval jurists mentioned are not obtained, are not present in Pakistan. So he, the reply to me, well here let's just say I understood from his reply that the answer was political. And I feel this is a mistake perhaps that some ulama did in this country is that for political, now what does it mean political? To assert Islam at the state of opportunity under the ruling, uh, under the rule of the government of General Zayal Haq, right? Now whether General Zayal Haq Saab was sincere, and I think he was largely sincere, whether he allowed, was just trying to couch his military dictatorship in religious legitimacy, that would probably also be partially the case, all right? So the ulama used whatever leeway he gave them so for them then they also accepted that this is symbolic and they felt that we have to assert ourselves symbolically in this manner so that at least symbolically it is established that Islam is in the Constitution is part of the legal system will be part of the laws right 
The problem with that symbolic assertion was that practically speaking, the ulama were not involved in drafting the laws. And so there was a lot of problem in the way the hadood ordinances were drafted and the way the evidentiary procedural process would evolve, the way even FIRs were lodged and people were arrested, what, how long, jail, pre-trial, right, etc., etc. A lack of education in the lower courts about how to judge and adjudicate these zina offenses. There was a lot of problems because they already explained to you previously, there are a lot of problems in the Pakistani legal and justice system when it comes to any law, right? So then what happened was that obviously the Nair lobby in Pakistan blamed all of that on the ulama, right? And then every single practical problem with the Hadood ordinance, as well as its symbolic, as well as being symbolic of Pakistan not being a secular state, but rather an Islamic republic, was something that was critiqued. And by then it was sort of out of the hands of the ulama. You may remember actually a few years ago thing that some people, they tested the waters and there, in, I think it was three, four years ago that Pakistan should actually formally ch its name and its status from an Islamic Republic and simply become a secular Republic symbolically and in name because it is that in reality in large parts, right? So discussion and this debate, I'm calling that political because it's not really that Islam is true or secularism too, it's different sort of different interest groups, different influence groups, different power players hijacking Islam, sometimes critiquing Islam uh, for the sake of political maneuvering, political positioning and political power. All right. Uh, there was a time when Nawaz Sharif also made the Islami Jumhuri Ittihad, IJI, and now some conspiracy theorists of which there is no shortage in Pakistan, they like to think why uh, General Musharraf removed him, right? Because he was going to do nifaz of shariat highly unlikely uh, but in any case when he did get a government which you saw there was no clearly no uh, movement in that direction anyway right uh, here so there's a lot of things that the media spins out in your urdu talk shows and in the ingolums and also the urdu columns but i i can't read such small urdu <laughs> that's a very difficult thing for me the font size in the Urdu newspaper column is so small. Hmm? But I know that's a whole world and at some point, you know, I would like to engage with that as well. And I think perhaps a lot I think perhaps the Urdu language newspaper opinion sections are perhaps more diverse than the English language newspaper opinion pieces, but I can't sure. Uh, because I don't personally uh, I don't personally read them. So this is, you know, this is I'm giving so so we went from the discussion of reformism, the example of the punishment for theft, showing you that it does have a context, showing you there are many other things to look at, generally to the concept of hudud, and then also showing you some things, how things play out in Pakistani society. This is not confined just to Pakistan, very similar debates and discussions, in particular Egypt, and still in Turkey, because the secular forces in Turkey are still extremely strong. And then there's a whole manipulation of the courts. Uh, this is something I showed you last, uh, about the Syria appellate bench of the Supreme Court and the Federal Sharia Court and that the ulama judges will always be a minority and in that sense the secularists will always have a veto power or veto power will always be able to overrule or outnumber the ulama judges right and that that has happened uh, in instances in this country similarly in Egypt you have this constitutional court Turkey has these courts so there's there's a lot of interplay between military judiciary and the other organs of the state that has to do with the religion as well, right? And these three countries are very good examples of it. Egypt, Turkey, and Pakistan. And in some very important countries as well in the Muslim world, okay? All right. So that, okay, now going back to our more theoretical discussion on reform as one example of revelation. Now let's look at prophethood, yani the context of the sunnah and the universal application of the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, even in a non-academic way, some people will hear people say very flippant things. Flippant means things that are just completely, you know. For example, I've heard this on more than one occasion. Quote, if Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive today, ye khatnaak jumlai. <laughs> Normally a person who says this, the second part of the sentence is going to say something. Which, so let me give you examples of things I have heard. Hmm? If the Prophet Sallallahu was alive today, he would wear jeans and t-shirt. <laughs> Allah Akbar. 
I mean, this also shows a strange obsession with symbolism, hmm? right? A strange, you know, is this the first thing you tell me? You should have said if the Prophet ﷺ was alive today, he would sit and eat with the poor. If the Prophet ﷺ was alive today, he would be crying over the state of the Ummah. There's so many other sentences to write before you come up with this idea, hmm? that he would have pants shirt. Hmm? ابھی اتنا زیادہ آپ کو پینٹ شرٹ کا شوق لگ گیا کہ آپ نے نبوت کے یعنی زبان مبارک میں اس چیز میں ڈالنا ہے But if he was given earthly life on the surface of earth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I think his eyes would be, have so much tears that he might not even be able to, at first, be aware of who's wearing what, because there are much more serious problems in the ummah, right? So actually what happens when it's flippant, it means there's unfortunately a lot of taunting, a lot of mocking, a lot of cynical, sarcastic, jesting, snide remarks. This is, I mean, and they would never talk like this in front of the you know the Americans that they admire so much the same you know I, I travel a lot between Pakistan and America because I was born and raised in America my parents in America I can tell you the same Pakistanis <laughs> not the I mean <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna offend you not the ones like me who are born and raised there the ones who are born and raised here but then go immigrate there and live there for 20 years they're so nice and polite in America and as soon as they come back here they revert to all of this inappropriate, they'd say things here and behave in ways that they would never be of their American and Canadian friends. Hmm? I remember once I was on the uh, uh, flying to America and one of these fellows, and I, and I can also, right? Uh, he cut me in line, right? I told him in clear English, I said, would you have cut me in line if we were standing in New York? He looked at me, and very quietly, he just moved back. He didn't even, he very quietly he moved right back. <laughs> hmm? That's it, you know. And then in the plane, I went to him and I sat down and I, Gapshapi lagayon se baad mein. Pertta hai, samjana bhi pertta hai, manwana bhi pertta hai, papi bhi dena pertta hai, kisim kisim ki tarikah hai tarbiyat ke. Anyway. Right? So I just wanted to give you an example of that, now more aspect of this reformist. But unfortunately, and that's why you know, a lot of you are laughing, unfortunately a lot of the reformists do this a lot. <laughs> a lot of it is the cynical mockery of Islam. And that is very dangerous, you know? And that actually the ulama, they call this istighfaf of sunnah. That's uh, istighfafi, no? Uh, that this is a kind of mm, ridiculing sunnah to make it minuscule, literally. Right? And this is a very grave thing. This is a very wrong thing. Yes, if okay, you have freedom of opinion, freedom of expression of that opinion, let's have an academic discussion on whether it needs to be reformed or it has a context. But let's leave all this mockery. And a liberal secular elites in Pakistan, they can't leave that. Their columnists and Don, Omer, Omer Javed, and they, they just they, they have this in their Twitter accounts and in their articles. You will see over and over again mocking, mocking, attacking, right? It's not civil discourse, it's not beneficial discourse. And this is one of the greatest problems in this country right now, right? Okay, now let's look. So I'm not, I'm not going to give the other comments about do you dri drive, a, drive a car. This was, this was one lumps professor emailed the whole student body this about me that if you like his turban so much, why don't you ask him to ride a camel to work instead of driving? I lived on campus, I used to walk anyway. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is the extent that people go to. So I'm not going to talk about any of those other things because that has nothing to do, any, any educated person will realize that this is irrelevant stuff. The question is that are there things in the hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that should be confined to that context that are no longer relevant today, especially to go back, is there any sense that, or liberalism, or humanism, or modernism, or the any core fundamental assumptions of these things that are making some Muslims reevaluate and reconsider the hadith of Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Let me with that. First of all, that premise is itself flawed. The only way you can reopen and reassess and reevaluate a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
is on the basis of the Quranic epistemology, on the basis of all of the knowledge and content from the Quran, from the rest of the Sunnah. You cannot reopen and reassess and re-examine a hadith on the basis of the fundamental principles of a different rival epistemology, such as secularism, liberalism, humanism, or modernism. In a nutshell, if you want to know what reformism does, reformism takes those other rival epistemologies and am I moving this is you're supposed to copy when I move this one Pardon? okay what reformism does these other rival epistemologies and then it re-examines and then tries to reinterpret and reformulate the Quran and Sunnah in light of those other rival epistemologies that's basically what the reformist effort is all right its core, it's flawed. It's taking a lower source of knowledge. Quran and Sunnah is divinely revealed knowledge. Secularism, humanism are human made knowledge. It's taking human made knowledge and elevating it and making it an arbiter over divinely revealed knowledge. It's taking human made knowledge and choosing to use that as the interpretants on how to examine, understand, and apply divinely revealed knowledge. So this is fundamentally flawed at its core. The reformist project is theoretically fundamentally flawed at the very outset. Okay? All right. Now, so let's see if any of you, would any of you like to ask me, uh, why don't you pick a hadith that you think or you've ever heard, whether it's Ramdi Saab or somebody else, can you think of a hadith? that you have ever encountered interpretation of and I'll use that as a case study. Mufti Sahib? Hmm? I will that, but that's a little bit pertaining to what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, so let's say within the Sunnah, within the Sunnah, you will find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself taught or practiced or allowed something only once or due to a very restrict, particular, specific set of circumstances. So then, whenever we try to derive any lesson or law from that we must we can only derive a lesson and law from that to the extent that the current case matches the particular specific set of circumstances of the original case of the sunnah so to give to take this example and i'll repeat it uh, because many people have heard that in the battle of uhud uh, of the female Sahabiyat, women, women uh, first generation students of Nabi Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Muslims were in a kind of partial initial apparent defeat, but later they did have a kind of partial victory as well, right? They were retreating, some of the women left the safe confines of Medina Manara to treat and attend to the wounded Mujahideen, Matar Sahabakram. Uh, the wounded uh, companions of the Prophet So then the correct understanding and then in some sense universal application of this would be take context. So this is very interesting to point out that the reformists take context when it suits them and context when it doesn't suit them. Here the context doesn't suit the reformists because the context actually is restrictive. So the context would be that today once again if there are men who are so physically injured and there are no men available to treat them and there are women who have the skill to treat them, then due to this necessity, the rura of saving life, women can go and attend to that man. Right? And the jurists have made a ruling, that that which is necessary will be deemed necessary only to the extent necessary. Right? So if somebody says, I have no food, pork chop. <laughs> All right? 
So then this is another interesting thing that the reformers do, and actually I'm, and now I'm thinking about it, I'm very happy you asked the question. Uh, I'm always happy when you ask a question, because I'm very fond of you anyway. But this also shows that the reformers drop context. So what the questioner was generally was correctly pointing out is that sometimes they will take incense in the sunnah, extrapolate them, and say, well, if that was allowed then, parts of the Arab world where the, you can very clearly see the people only pray the fard, salah, right? And that is because the sunnah, uh, has they say that well this is just something that is purely optional. So to give you an example, Sayyidina Rasulullah to Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not use these terms exactly Farad Wajib, Sunnah Waqada, Sunnah Ghair Waqada, right? He didn't use these terms himself the different types of prayers he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed. What happens is, is that we look in the history and we will find that the three types of prayer that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed. And what the jurors do, the fuqaha, they basically make categories and they apply tags. It's very much like database, right? So the first type of prayer is that prayer that Sayyidina Rasulullah himself prayed every, in every single occasion. And it comes in the text, and in the Quran and Sunnah, that in every single occasion. And about that prayer, even in one passage in the Quran, it is mentioned that if you are engaged in a just war with an enemy details of how to pray that prayer in that situation is mentioned if you are sick it is mentioned that you can pray sitting or lying on your side right plus texts that establish it and emphasize it and give wa'id or puni mention punishment and, and sort of damnation of it that type of prayer that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam always prayed and all of the above the jurists labeled that as all right. There was a second type of prayer that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always prayed, I like the first one, when he except due to a known identifiable reason, such as traveling, suffer, such as illness, marad, such as engaged in battle, right? So that's the second type of prayer that was prayed always but was left due to a knowable reason. So that if you're going to follow the sunnah means that you will also pray that prayer always, but you can also leave it due to the same reasons. The second thing about this prayer is that you don't have the same type of verses in Quran or the same emphasis in the hadith about this prayer. But you do have mention of this prayer with a less mm, obligation. So that prayer was tagged by the jurists as sunnah and for the Hanafi jurists, sunnah mu'akkada no reason whatsoever not for an identifiable reason for no reason whatsoever in other words that means they're optional so the jurists they put a tag on that type of prayer wafil maybe you can call sunnah the ghair muqadda mustahab mandub nafil they're different words so then but well, you're just following the sunnah right so you can leave that prayer for no reason whatsoever meaning busyness laziness whatever right you also will do that prayer sometimes, right? It doesn't mean that it's never there, because that would also, technically speaking, not be sunnah, right? Occasionally, at least. Randomly. That's a way if you want. I mean, the Prophet obviously did it more occasionally, less randomly than we will, but by and large, they were prayed occasionally. All right? Okay. All right. Here, I think you've understood the issue, because I, I don't want to spend so much time on reformism, because we have to move forward. All right. Islamophobia. Phobia in the Muslim world, this is something I've talked about already earlier, but I talked about it before the slide. Elites, the education sector, civil society, and media. I think I've, I've explained this enough to you already. All right? Uh, those who were here in the I explained what Islamophobia was. There are different types of elites in this country, in any country. There's political elites, there are economic elites, and there are educated elites. And in all three, there are religious, there's shades and a whole spectrum of religiosity. There's shades and spectrum of a whole irreligiosity. There's of liberal secularism. There's levels of illiberal secularism. All types of things are found in the elites, right? But, so I'm not saying have Islamophobia. But Islamophobia itself is only found in the elites. You don't have any Islamophobia in the middle class or in the lower class or in the mass that they are trying to create a fear and an hysteria uh, about Islam. All right, so is that clear? So we're not saying all elites are Islamophobes. Islamophobia is to be found in the elites. 
from the different sectors in this country, one place where Islamophobia is found more relatively to others to the education sector. And I already gave you several examples of that right in the morning earlier session. In civil society and media, society there are some NGOs, so I will give you an example, and I've given this example before, I'll always, I feel a bit sad now because my cousin, she passed away, my first cousin, founder of an organization known as Orat Foundation, which was one of the earliest and most established women's rights organizations in this country. All right. Uh, and another, I mean, it's still run by our family members. So, you know, I mean, I would obviously meet my family members being in Pakistan. So I distinct once when uh, this issue of um, uh, the honor killing and acid uh, acid attacks, right? Shocked that there was a suggestion in the discussion that was taking place in the family and that particular family gathering that somehow uh, Molvis are responsible for this. So I spoke up and I said, okay, look, it's very easy. I will get a group of ulama. We won't charge anything. And we would like the Ord Foundation to, we will go with the Ord Foundation and any and every community where you see because you know better, we accept that, that you were working in the communities and you know where these things are happening. I will, or I will myself also come and arrange for others to go to those communities and we will formally issue fatwas from the member, even in Jamabian, against these. They never got back to me. Why? Right? So Allah knows best. You know, I mean, I don't want to talk about my family, but some, let's say some civil society organizations uh, need to maintain this narrative uh, that everything is the Malvi's fault. And they actually don't want this narrative to be countered. Uh, they don't want, this is not good uh, funding for this. <laughs> and the funding, the funding application will say that we need more funding to go deep into the villages because the religious people sit in silently condoning, not condemning, silently condoning acid attacks and uh, honor killing. They're not going to get funding by writing that, oh, you know, a whole bunch of Malvis went for free and they handled this whole issue. <laughs> this could be one reason, Allah Allah, right? But definitely a lot of the narrative in this country is to blame religion for the problems of this country. So if you took any simple political science class and that a country, so let's look at the different things that you study in political science. Is religion or religious people, the just scholars, to blame for whatever are the faults in parliament. No. Is religion, religious scholars, or religiosity to blame for whatever flaws there are in the bureaucracy, civil service, foreign service, DMG, police service? No. Is religion, religiosity, or religious scholars to blame for the entire crisis, higher judicial system, and lack of access to justice, whether in the higher courts or the lower courts? No. Is religion, religiosity, religious scholars to, for the lack of access to health care to the ordinary poor Pakistani? No. Are religion, religiosity, religious scholars to blame for the f and the oppression of the feudal land owners on their serfs, basically in, in much of rural Sindh and rural Punjab? No. Right? Uh, I mean, I could go on, right? There's so many problems in the country that religion, religiosity, uh, and religious scholars have nothing to do with those problems. I'll give you another example, right? The MIT, Pre MIT is the ultimate university of science in the world. MIT Press published George Saliba's book, again, on the history of Islam, and where George Saliba establishes conclusively that Islam was not responsible for the decline of science. All right? I have in another presentation on Ghazali have pointed out where, where Pervez Hudboy has absolutely falsely attributed to Imam al-Ghazali but all I would do is ask Pervez Hudboy a simple question that you never won the Nobel Prize in physics was there any, did religion religiosity or religious scholars stop you winning the Nobel Prize all of your students that you have taught in 30 years in Pakistan have never won the Nobel Prize or any other significant award. Was it really religion and religiosity and religious scholars that stopped all of them from Nobel Prize? I will take Pervez Hudboy and offer him that let's go take a tour of University of Punjab and University of Karachi, physics, chemistry, and biology departments and labs, and shocked at what we see. But if the 
standard isn't there, can you really see, is it religion or religiosity or religious scholars who have kept that, suppressed that standard? Hmm? It's just hype. It's hysteria. It's called Islamophobia. All right? Blame Islam for problems or blame living Muslim problems or blame contemporary Islamic scholars for problems that actually they blame for, right? Okay, he claims that no, but Islam as a religion teaches that you should not think creatively and that's why we don't have so many Muslim scientists today. Okay, let's look at history. When Islam was at its height in Baghdad and the greatest Muslim civilization, which means also, also as a religious and spiritual faith and force, it was also at its height. That was actually when Islam produced the most Muslim science. Not just George Sleba, but many other historians write about, whether in astronomy or mathematics, right? And now, if I accept in the, in the Muslim world, there are less scientists due more to power and wealth. You know, like for example, the sociologist Michel Foucault says that knowledge is about power. Do we have the same fund as? That's the real problem in University of Punjab, University of Karachi, right? So it's, it's a first world, third world thing. So the, the data set statistically that you would compare Muslim scientists to would be non-Muslim scientists from equal, the same socioeconomic countries, right? So this is actually more of what they call a developing world problem, right? And that science has become an extremely money-intensive elite research endeavor. And there are individual Muslims, many Muslims who have done PhDs in science from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT. There are a fair number of Muslim professors in these institutes. There are a fair number of Muslim scientists as researchers in labs. There are many brilliant Pakistani Muslim doctors and were cardiologists and top surgeons in New York City, Manhattan, whereas maybe 30 years ago, n the bulk of the top doctors were Jewish. So they're all Muslim. I know some of them were very practicing and their faith and practice has not in any way numbed their ability to do scientific or medical activity, right? So the data's not there, but he keeps saying it. And he says this, and he's been repeating and writing it for 20 years. And nobody calls him out on it. Hmm. Even, like I told you, the honest, academic, liberal, they'll call him out privately. I, I've seen them in private, but they won't take him on publicly. Hmm. Example of Islamophobia. This is a perfect example of Islamophobia, right? So this is a problem. All right, now we move to the last aspect. So, if you remember, we had said that being religious in the age of irreligiosity. So given all the things I've mentioned, so listen to, especially if there's a person who operates in this world. So there's an educated Muslim. So he's interacting in the university. He's interacting in newspapers. He wants to be a member, a contributing, me a contributing member of civil society. And the more you engage in this, the more you will be faced with these irreligious or Islamophobic tendencies. So how do you navigate this maze? Number one, your faith. Your Iman has to be built up to the level of Yaqeen. That is why we did the day. Those of you here on day one, your Iman has to be built up to the level of Because unless you have absolute certainty in your deen, all these other things will shake you. I've seen Pervez Hudboy shake people's faith. Is, I'm not the only professor who has an effect. There are many professors who have an effect, right? Because the person wasn't strong in their iman. In fact, people's iman has become so weak that even somebody who makes arguments which have so many fallacies in them, who makes statements that have no facts to back them up, even their words have an effect on shaking up the person's faith. What per kabira? Hmm? Very strange. Hmm? So it means then that any parents who send their children to university, sure that prior to and continually during that child's university years, they must make sure, especially prior to and during, that the child has a very strong iman and their consistent multiple efforts of learning and interaction that keep reinforcing the strength of that child's iman. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. You're looking for trouble, I would say. You're in hmm? You cannot enter a realm or an environment of faithlessness or weakness in outright faithlessness or even anti-religious 
unless your own iman and deen is strong. Hmm? May Allah Ta'ala keep all of us in his fazza. It's not like after we pass out, no one is safe, right? You have to accept that. It's part of the times that we live in. Hmm? But that's not like if a person lives in a very cold climate, like way up, you know, like Siberian thing. So they just accept that and they always wear really strong winter gear. But did you have to think that we're living in a spiritually cold climate? Hmm. And we must all the ones who are writing opinion pieces and columnists. You should be the ones who are teaching humanities and social sciences. You have to engage. And there's another problem that the religious classes abandon the field entirely. You know? I remember at Lums and all those people were computer science, you know. I was one, you know. But they reached the time at time actually in our department because one poor professor used to fast but then he stopped fasting you know during my tenure. I was like the only one who would fast in like the whole department. Hmm? I was like the only one who would fast in like the whole department. Hmm? In the law department, not the social, social sciences. There were a couple of obviously there were one or two other Islamic studies professors, but it was professors, but it was a minority. <laughs> That would be strange for you, because those of you who work in the corporate world and computer science, you would say 95% of our office fasts, right? I'm telling you in the humanities and social sciences and law department at these elite universities, there's a minority, hmm. a very small minority, not like 49%, a very small minority. Hmm. That means you've abandoned the field, right? Fine, you mean, it, those of you who generally prefer computer science and engineering, no doubt you should do, I mean, I'm not saying you have to change your major or leave your professional field. But the point is that there have to be some Muslims who go into this field, go into these fields, all right? There have to be Muslims who have Islamic-based women's uh, advocacy foundations. There have to be organizations that are tackling the issue of honor killing and acid burning. You can't just leave it to organizations that are operating on the basis of a rival epistemology. If you knew anything about Africa, this is another way the Christianity there. They go in with money, with relief and humanitarian work, and they use that relief and humanitarian activity for proselytizing converting. And they're very successful at it. So that, that is actually itself statistical evidence and proof that relief and humanitarian work can be done with an additional aspect of preaching and proselytizing. Now Muslims are doing it, but they're, again, there's scope for much more. Right? If you do sin the flood relief and you're a religious person, then there's a chance that when you help the flood relief victim, you can also help them connect to God, back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can help them find morality. You could develop a nice network in sin to overthrow the feudal landlords of sin. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but there's no hope you can even do that because you don't even know who the people are in sin. Hmm? I mean, don't think I'm advocating violence, but I'm definitely advocating revolution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a, a revolutionary movement to overthrow feudalism in this country. Because the military has interests in land. Everybody's in the game. <laughs> the military has landed interests. The feudalists have landed interests. Industrialists have landed interests. Parliamentarians have landed interests. Everybody's in the game. And this is why Pakistan is one of the ranked countries in terms of feudalism and land reform and these things. India is way ahead. They're still, they're still there. Jagadari is still there to some extent. But oh, way ahead. Way ahead. And if nothing else, Pakistan, you have to look at India as a very good example in terms because our history is very common and very shared. Same colonial of things are shared. Right? But there is no, no one. You know how much work has to be done in Balochistan? Hmm? Although the army, I don't really understand what exactly the situation reason is. But whatever, it's some super sensitive thing. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, I've been to Balochistan. And you can clearly tell it's been extremely suppressed. <laughs> artificially repressed uh, from having an equal share in the development, equal share in the pie in this country. Mm. If the people of Deen were to do that, then not only could you then bring about upliftment, economic and social, and repel the injustice, you'd agent to bring them closer to Deen. Right? Don't do it. Don't do it. So all of this is what I'm calling this dynamic engagement in civil society. Of networks and advocacy. I'll give you another example. 
So, at least in principle, in what we call black letter law, in the Constitution it says that uh, there cannot be any law in this country that is Now, for example, you know, you read about in the... I also know, I mean, I don't know so much, but from what I see in Pakistan, there are always random people sending to the Supreme Court against ABC politician, right? Always against corruption, disqualification, etc. Fine. Whatever that is, that is, I don't know. Where are the petitions? Where is the advocacy against, let's say, I mean, in Karachi, I think it's taking here, but let's say billboards or Coke Studio, stuff that is going on open, that's so clearly, blatantly, you know. Your Ali, is that guy's name? Ali Nawazish, right? I mean, you had when, when America be called drag queen, you had him on TV, you know. Uh, I mean, it's the dunya, you know. You can you Google the National Geographic. National Geographic, which is supposed to be the magazine and channel you know about dolphins and about the forest. National Geographic did a special on, because this is part of the research I did when I first joined Lumps to understand this society. National Geographic did a special eat party culture of the Pakistani youth. A cheap video. There's clear drinking. There's, there, oh, National Geographic. National Geographic. Don Harold did an article. It's all before, you know, before 2005, this one about the raves and parties in Islamabad and in the farmhouses and the rooftops and I don't know what, right? Hmm? Drug culture there is in the high school universities. Do you know how much these drug dealers peddle and pray and people of drug overdoses? Hmm? We, you, nobody's going to do it for you. <laughs> You will have to form a culture, you will have to do advocacy, you will have to lead it. Like mashallah, you know, there are many private initiatives here in terms of like cost. There are people who are networking with another and they do network and they do certain things, right? That same network could do more. There's a lot more advocacy. Advocacy means, you know, to have take up causes, economic causes, moral causes, right? And to do it in a faith-based religious way. Unfortunately, uh, because the public sector and the government may not be so in societies like that, then the private sector has to fill in, right? And that's what they did. I mean, what is this? These schools and these clinics, that's also the government's job, right? So you're filling in the gaps over there in the public sector, there's other gaps. The next thing I've mentioned is collaborative research. So this is, if you remember, the second. Uh, the title line given this, so I didn't uh, explain to you. So I've been doing the second session. The title was Traditional Islam and the 20, Filling in the Gaps. This was the title, Traditional Islam in the 21st Century, Filling the Gaps. So what I mean here, and that's what this slide is in some ways, is that the ulama can only do so much. You know, the ulama who are age 50 and above, let's say, right? They can only do so much, and they've already done a lot, right? But sometimes people feel, okay, there's a gap. It's like, oh, why don't the ulama do this? Or why don't the ulama say this? Fine. I accept it to you on their behalf that there are a few things that they're not able to do. But my question to you is why don't you fill in the gaps? Why don't you see that they actually have covered maybe 80, 90% of the canvas and there's 10% work left to be done? And I would even go further to suggest that the type of gaps people like even me and you identify probably be better filled by us under the guidance and supervision of the ulama with their du'as, with their instructions, but you are the people in society, right? And ulama are absent from society, maybe, that's true to some extent. I'll tell you when I did one institute of learning that I studied in, so the principal, he took me for a walk, the muhtamim, and he said to me, ke, he himself said to me, hame us muashat ke baare mein batai jiske qiyadat hame karne chahiye tha. They said to me, that, tell me about that society that the ulama are supposed to be the guard takers of. In other words, he was confessing that we've lost touch. We don't know what's going on out there. You know? But he was very genuine. He wants to know and he wanted to, you know, and, and keep, you know, trying, at that moment anyway, he was trying to keep pushing and support me on different things. So this is another type of network. The network between the non-scholarly religious people and the scholarly class. You have to work together. It's not just Islamic banking and finance with the shit. It's Islamic banking and finance. I was telling them, I'm a cold regret though. I told them openly, you just make one bank from top to bottom, and that would have been enough, right? But the problem is that you had to actually 
completely you know control the field because if otherwise wrong interpretations and things would enter the field this is another problem in the country hmm? so I think this issue of filling the gap is really more our duty and I gave you some examples of collaborative research yesterday with the doctors and scholars example you had a PhD finance and scholars example so one very important area which hasn't happened yet is lawyers and judges and scholars collaboration so we have seen in banking and finance accountants bankers PhDs in finance working with scholars we've seen to a much lesser extent but at least a little bit doctors and you know scientists who work in the area of medicine and working with scholars in issue of biomedical ethics but perhaps the greatest area of collaborative research two three greatest areas that's almost non-existent one is in law right and the other is in humanities and social sciences right I would like to take a few econo economists and a few scholars and maybe a few you know bureaucrats who work in the field of economic and see you know what really you know what can be done right same for sociology same for other things even for humanity same for philosophy which I did for you in the first day almost non-existent all right scholars and leadership right okay not all of you uh, but it, we need scholars now from every community and every socio-economic strata so historically in this country it's not 100% true but I would percent uh, Multisab can correct me if he thinks I'm wrong you spent more time recently in the Madaris but about 85% of the students in Dar Alums are from a lower class lower middle class background which is right but when you know like a person who lives in Karachi defense or Karachi society comes and tells me that oh my son doesn't feel close to the imam of his local masjid I said but you know that's because your end of society has failed to produce Islamic scholars <laughs> so obviously they're gonna be out of touch right so then why don't you make your son and then you'll say oh um, very nice to meet you uh, <laughs> until and unless this segment of society produces not every you know this one beautiful thing is that there'll be a South African business if they have multiple sons it's a very classic South African thing that there'll be one son who does the business and one son becomes a scholar but they just do this and the one who does the business he supports the scholar also his whole life so the scholar has a bit of fin Defendants gives the scholar a bit more, you know, istighna, a bit more power uh, to correct things. Huh? You have to produce scholars from this segment. The kind of kids who go to IB and LUMS or, you know, or the university educated, don't abandon, but try to become some as well versed in Islamic scholarship as you can. Because it's going to take, in some cases, some of the gaps may be filled by a dual-trained person. Some of the gaps that you see in the way traditional Islam is navigating the 21st century can only by someone who has some training and competence in some other field, whatever the field may be, whether it's philosophy or finance or science, and in classical Islam, some of the gaps require a dual-trained person. Not everybody may have the ability or the time or the aptitude to do that, but there are some. We have experience with a few. We have also, Alhamdulillah, had the blessing from Allah Ta'ala to try to contribute to this, but that's just a very... And the last thing is leadership, right? And obviously we would want that the leadership should include some ulama. Leadership will also have to include some of the religious people who are not ulama in different segments of civil society, right? Because the youth needs some type of leadership, right? And that looking. So here, so this slide is, you know, needs to be done, but unfortunately, you know, it's more than individual effort. And the slide before it, uh, that really is your more, I mean, that's where you have to begin in any case. That's the starting point. That is also something that a person can do individually. All right. Otherwise, if we don't do these two things that are on these two slides, then just hope that the current situation will continue and continue to deteriorate and to keep getting worse. All right. So there's some sense of, uh, it has to be, you know, what we call a collective shared responsibility. And you have to have collective ownership. And then you can have some type of collective response. So what I'm telling you is a very simple thing. I'm not taking it to the other level. 
you know, establish khilafah or, 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 you know, have a party that's going to win the government. I mean, I think those people may be sincere, but I think they're misguided and misguiding others. This is the level. So people then say, oh, but you just talk about individual. No, so this slide is individual. This slide is, second slide is what I do feel can be done collectively. Don't think I'm just talking about individual effort. There's a lot of, and then there's the next slide after. This is the collective. Analyze all of these things. So there's individuals, then there's groups of individuals and associations of individuals which are collectivities. And then the next stage is the institutionalization of those efforts, then multiple institutions, then collaborations between institutions, then after all of the effect and trickle-down effect that has in the society, then maybe you can have a political party. Yeah. <laughs> this is social sciences 101 I'm trying to explain to you here. But if I try to jump, leapfrog these things and talk to you about Khilafah, oh Allah, huh? uh, you, know, you know, I could 10 minutes talk to you about Khilafah, then you will come to your mouth and you will come to your mouth and you will But that's it. That's, what are you going to do after that? All right? We have to gently, politely, with love, talk to some of those people also and tell them, okay, look, you had this and we accept you were sincere and you tried it for 10, 15, 20 years. Maybe you start, at least join us in this. After this, you, <laughs> once we do this, you, <laughs> right? Well, you go to the next step. Let's do this first step first, though, together, right? Same even for yasa, which is politics. So it actually starts at this level. But that's my opinion. Obviously, they will, uh, as they say, they will beg to differ. They will rather insist on very vocally differing and, but the point is to show you that we are not just talking about individual, we are also talking about collective. All right. Alhamdulillah, we finished the second. And so now we're going to take your questions on today's first and two sessions. And I have the leftover questions, which I will just quickly grab from the first two days sessions. And so I'm going to try today actually to knock off all the questions, inshallah. Okay, let me take this question actually. So there are uh, there are two other topics uh, that often people use to challenge Islam. One is this issue of violence and terrorism, right? and jihad, and what is jihad, and a second is the issue of oppression of women, and the notion. So the allegation Islam does not grant women rights. Obviously, in four days, I could not cover every single topic. All right. Uh, I mean, minimum answer to this question about how to respond to the claim that Islam is a religion of violence uh, would require me another presentation. All right. Uh, but I can just suggest to you uh, that there is an answer um, that will be given first from the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah, once I gave a beyond on this topic actually, uh, and the person would have to be explained that you have to separate individual incidents that may have happened in history or continue to happen today from what Islam actually as a, uh, teaches. Okay. If modernism uh, supports suppressing others and the use of weapons on weak or poor. So note that I said that about colonialism. Uh, when I moved from modernism, I was talking about colonialism. Mo itself has no aspect of violence uh, or oppression necessarily. Uh, that was when I was talking about colonialism. 
Somebody is asking about actions and movements of Pakistan army and the people in tribal areas. Imam Bai, can I reply? Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so there is something, I don't really know about it, but I have heard about this recently, something called the Pakhtun or Pashtun, maybe Tahafuz movement, right? Uh, so I don't know about anything about the particular movement, but in, in, if in any way the army is doing any injustice in KPK or below the province or place for that matter, uh, I wouldn't call it, I mean the questioner is saying, I wouldn't call it an act of modernism, uh, I would just call it an act of injustice. Uh, and one of the problems in this country is that the army and the military operates without any checks and balances, without any transparency, and without any account. No doubt they would say that they're doing that in the interest of national security. I accept as a doctrine, every military should be given some leeway to do this in the interest of national security that doesn't have transparent accountability. I, but the question is, what is really national security? And what is, I mean, because the army in this country is also kind of about the monopoly of resources, and they're also a player in this game of competition for control of land, resources, energy, power, etc. And not really then going to be called the national interest, national security interest, that is just going to be called the army self interest. Uh, and that's why in any system you need checks and balances on every political actor lest they fall into this problem of doing things that are in their self-interest as opposed to the net. And the executive and bureaucracy can also be doing things in their self-interest. As you know very well, the parliament is doing things in their self-interest. Many, not all, but many parliamentarians do the interest. And this is the problem. And that's why a political system well designed and politics properly understood is that you must have checks and balances and accountability to ensure that people don't pursue or people or individuals and entire sectors don't pursue their self-interest then truly uh, pursue the national interest. Allah hifaz denga, don't worry. Is it not a good thing? Okay, I don't fully understand question, but the person on the top has written more of a comment than a question. So I've read the comment, and to the extent I understand it, I think I agree with it. Okay. A person is asking, and that's also no doubt a factor that in, uh, in the colonial period, uh, was it just a question of modern weaponry, or was it perhaps that we ourselves did not have adherence to the divine commands and as a consequence we did not have divine help. I uh, may indeed also be there and I did mention that to you that that was the revivalist uh, understanding that we have to revive deen and practice deen even more. That's so that failing and then we also do have to progress in science and technology to address this failing so we have the defensive capaci capacity to protect ourselves against an unjust offensive uh, attack from anyone. <coughs> Question, what if someone agrees to the but doesn't agree to a single ayah of Quran? So it really depends to what extent the level of disagreement is. If they say, I don't that as a verse of Quran and added by somebody else, that's a problem. If they say, if I believe it's a verse of Quran, but I don't think it should be applied anymore, that wouldn't put them in. I'm willing to expand the boundaries to keep them in. Like I explained to you yesterday, they're sincere, but they're misguided, all right? And there will be an educative uh, need to be done. Uh, this question I answered at the very beginning. This is an interesting question. Can the debate of Pakistan being originally secular or Islamic ever be settled? And I actually think that's a very good question. The answer is no. Uh, because if you, which I also think is wrong, but that Pakistan should be viewed as Jinnah's Pakistan, Jinnah himself had Islamic and secular elements. If you accept that Pakistan should be Jinnah's Pakistan, Iqbal also had Islamic and secular elements. It doesn't really matter at this point, actually. 
What was the, all the original creations and factors that led to the creation of Pakistan? You know, if you know your history really well, Jinnah himself even didn't originally want Pakistan. He remembers some type of quota system for the Muslim, and then when the Indians didn't give that, and the British pitched this idea to him. You know, I mean, there was there's a lot of a complicated history, and I'm, I'm not an expert in it. Uh, but I can tell you it's a very complicated history. We should study it and learn it, and it is relevant for us in terms of lessons, but it will not determine the nature of the country today and onward. Uh, in fact, that generation, uh, which in some whatever way was involved in the establishment of Pakistan or sacrificed for it, they're also 90% long gone by now. All right? So it's up, I think you do a new national narrative. And I think that is some, that's a very important task. And I think it's, that's, that's a perfect example of the type of civil society engagement that we need. Otherwise, the only people who sit and talk about the national narrative are, again, the secular, irreligious, sometimes liberal, liberal, sometimes open to religion, sometimes hostile, hostile to religion, humanities and social sciences professors of this country. And it's a very small minority. That's a 0.01% of the elites cannot determine or write the national narrative of this country. And they also know that their narrative is different from the masses. They will, and they also know that their narrative is different from the masses. They openly accept that. In fact, they're always horrified by these polls that say, "Oh, the vast majority of Muslims would want Sharia. The vast want Sharia. The vast majority of Muslims would want Islam." And that is why they've tried to capture <coughs> want Islam. And that is why they've tried to capture all the power of the state and keep it within their elite realm, because they know if they ever follow a true pop, follow a true populist form of democracy, the average masses would want things that are very democracy. The average masses would want things that are very different to what they want, and the masses would want things that go against their own self-interest in terms of interest, in terms of their economic self-interest, all right? So this is a perfect, or this debate and self-interest, all right? So this is a perfect, or this debate and discussion about what is Pakistan, and what does it mean to be Pakistani, and what is the future direction of Pakistan. Excellent example in which people of faith need to be more involved and more articulate and more dynamic, and, and not just participate, but ultimately lead uh, sh participate, shape, and ultimately lead this discussion. Are there any on here? Okay, let me pause, take some on here. Okay, if, if the Quran is so perfect, why is the Quran so vague? So this is something I had mentioned yesterday. Allah himself has said in Quran al Karim that there's some ayat verses that are muhkam, absolutely clear and definitive, and some that are mutashabih, that they may have full possible meanings that suggestively emerge from them that even closely resemble one another, means they're not entirely definitive. But if somebody went further, that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it that way? So this is a perfect example of some of the things I've been trying to explain. Our akal will, some of akal may view this as an imperfection. Now, our concept of perfection would have demanded that all of the revelation be muhkam. Clearly, Allah Ta'ala's wisdom and perfection is that part of the Qur'an is mutashabe. So now there's a competition. Me and my akal's understanding of perfection and Allah Ta'ala, the all-knowing, all-wise being's understanding of per perfection. That was one answer, right? A second answer is uh, that mutashabe, and I, I sort of wanted to clarify this from yesterday, because the second thing I mentioned yesterday at this juncture is that Allah Ta'ala said in Quran that ya, he, that he guides, also misguides. That's not the sole function, not the primary function of the mutashabe. It's not that the mutashabe and Quran are only there and always there in order to misguide people. One aspect of the mutashabihat is actually that many verses are what we call muhtamal ma'ani, that they contain layers of meaning, multiple meaning, so that the depths of meaning can be dived into by the jurists so that they can extrapolate and extract lessons and guidance for all time. All right? So that is one reason actually why uh, that the Quran al Karim has embedded in it the capacity of multiple scholarly interpretation. And that is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there is diverse and multiple interpretation, so that the entirety of the is able to guide humanity in different cultures and histories and contexts. 
Another question is that why is it necessary to worship God if we accept that He exists and we accept that He is the divine power? Why is that not enough? All right. Uh, worshipping God is the expression of the human submission and subordination to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, God does not need our worship. We need to worship Him. God is above and beyond needing any worship, whether of the angels or the human beings. Right? But we need to worship Him. So you can understand like this, to be human is to believe in Allah, fitrah. To be human is to know Allah. To be human is to to be human is to obey Allah and to be human is to worship Allah. These are some of our core human needs. So we need to do it. He doesn't need to do it. Now a person could say that I imagine I would rather have imagined a world in which existed and all he wanted from us is merely that we acknowledge his existence and he didn't require any obedience and worship from us at all. <laughs> right? I mean, that would be a easy life, right? But if all you do his existence, then why would you get a uh, Jannah for eternity just on that? Right? It doesn't seem uh, that the reward fits if it was just merely acknowledging. But yes, if there's a system where in addition to acknowledging his existence, you must obey him when you are in fact tempted to disobey him. You must worship him when sometimes you wish you didn't have to. That struggle and that dedication and that commitment seems more likely to be something that would have been worthy of an eternal reward. Why isn't the person who committed sin punished in this world? Uh, some I've got a message that says no sound. Uh, okay, okay. Um, Allah Ta'ala does punish people for sins in this world. Uh, so this is a mistaken assumption. It's up to Allah's fault. Some people He will punish in this world. Some people He will forgive entirely in this world or the next life. Some He will punish only in the next life. So it's all options are there. Only this world, only next life, both as a guidance. Alright? Uh, so it's not uh, technically true that a person is punished in this world. Oh, question. Since most of the reformists go against the core beliefs of Islam, is it them unbelievers? No. And expose them openly to people. You can definitely, academically, refute them and engage them openly with people. But uh, reformist Muslims are not unbelievers. All right? They do not deny those core beliefs. They may sometimes try to make those core beliefs fit into what they think is the contemporary context and many times they're sincere you know sometimes they begin oh we need to make Islam easy for the people right I mean the other one is I need to make Islam easy for myself that's not normally a sincere thing but sometimes they say we want to make Islam easy for the people right uh, they may make mistakes in how they do that uh, but if I already explained to you yesterday right First of all, that we're going to expand the boundaries and limits as much as possible. Then there's going to be a person who has certain, who adheres to certain things that are unbelief, and to proclaim them to be an unbeliever. And it's only the final frontier and extreme that a person will be proclaimed and declared as an unbeliever. All right, uh, and in, in that case, and in their case, in any case, uh, I mean the reformist, reformist Islam itself—they're uh, not unbelievers. Uh, you suggested collaborative research, but Pakistani universities aren't doing any original work. They just paste it. Does that mean we have to go to foreign universities? How, I'm just saying it has to be done. It's going to be done in a Pakistani university or foreign university. That's a separate discussion. Make dua. Allah Ta'ala makes such Pakistani universities where you can do this type of collaborative research. All right. What should be the process of building a community which will practice Islam in its true sense in all aspects, economic, legal, social, in Pakistan specifically? That is the second slide I gave you. That is what I suggest and feel should be the start of that process. And that is my second question. I'm taking them in reverse order. Cutting the line. Huh? Holding them, yeah. 
I've already commented on that hadith sufficiently. Uh, I don't think that that hadith gives license to some entirely unrestricted women's role in society. Uh, but that hadith is clearly allowing women to up necessity. Can we have yakin based on mushahada instead of tafakkur and akal? So I showed you the verses in Quran about akal and tafakkur, and you come and show me the verses on mushahada. They don't exist. Right? So if we want to take the answer from Quran in that sense, right? Uh, so if you want to take your answer from Quran, the answer is that you will do an tafakkur. If somebody claims that they reach such an enlightened Sufi state that they get mushahada of the haqqaiq of Islam, if this truly happens, this happens at the very end stage after tafakkur and aql and iman and ilm and a'mal and ikhlas and ajz and humility and so many things, then yeah, as Allah Ta'ala puts in a person's heart from himself, which I did that already, may yu'min billahi yahdi kalbahu, that Allah, to whomsoever has iman and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala may send hidayah in their heart, they make a kind of, maybe not what the questioner is suggesting, but a kind of unveiling. For example, sometimes a jurist would get this feeling in their heart that the they had an inclination towards a juristic ruling based on the academic research. But then they would do ruju ilallah. They would turn to Allah Ta'ala and then Allah would inspire their heart that yes. And so then they would have certainty then about that legal ruling. All right. So that is a type of mushahada. Sometimes a person at that about Allah Ta'ala themselves. This is called qurban taqarrub. They may, in, and I talked about this in the first day, religious experience. So they may in sajda feel a qubba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they may have a feeling when they hear the adhan or they may have some sensual intense feeling when they're making tawaf or reading Quran or making zikr of Allah's name or so many things or even just even not even necessarily in religious worship so yes they may get some feeling that gives them the, uh, some experience that gives them that feeling of yaqeen right uh, this question I addressed yesterday I don't think you would have been here, but it's asking about sex and our deobandi and railway and these things, sex. Why don't we just simply call ourselves Muslim? So what is a sect? Uh, oh, this may be from the Jamaat al Muslimin people. Ma'akum al Muslimin. Muslimin to ayna? Jamaat al Muslimin to ayna Quran me. Karachi has, I, I, Karachi is, you know, you guys have some... There was some, you know, somebody sent me a video of some mem and uncle. How, you know about that, right? So there's some mem, some mem and uncle going at it with some Newtown Molvey. A jeeb ghrib video. Huh? Some of you may know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But like, yeah, I got you, man. All right, here. Uh, so the first part I answered yesterday, what exactly is a sect? So these things are not a sect. But let me answer the second question. Which, but the second part is a very good question. Why do we not simply call ourselves just Muslim? And they've written here why Sunni Shia. Okay. So when you say you're a Muslim, there are certain things that you must necessarily mean by that. Okay. So those are the secondary issues, which I didn't do. So remember I did the slide of the core beliefs. So now without the slide, I can construct for you the secondary belief. I'll just show you the first slide again, just so you see it. The thing you're saying when you say I'm a Muslim is that you believe in these things. That, that, that's done, right? S and, and that's everyone, right? That's the Ubandi, Ibril, Vialadis, etc., etc. Okay, so all of them can just say, I'm a Muslim, because I'm a Muslim means I believe in the existence, oneness, attributes, and acts of God's mentions, God, Allah Ta'ala mentioned Quran Kareem, the perfection, completion, and wonder of revelation, the perfection, final and prophet of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and all the aspects. All right. There's now a secondary set of beliefs. You will necessarily hold a belief on them. I'm going to show you. Therefore, you are necessarily, you must be either Sunni or Shia. For example, well, there are three options. I'll give you three options. Either you believe that all the Sahaba Ajma'in are all believers, or you believe that the vast minority of them were believers and the majority were unbelievers. Take one of these two positions. If you try to take the third position, which is I do tawakkuf, I don't make any claim whatsoever, that itself is a position. You won't be a Sunni. There's only three positions. Either you say you know for sure that every one of them is a believer, you say you know for sure that the majority were unbelievers, or you say you don't know. Fourth rational possibility, right? 
Just like this, I will go one by one and issue with you. These are called akli ihtimalat. That rationally, logically speak, must believe one of these possibilities. The person who says, I believe, number one, that all of the companions of Sayyidina Rasulullah are believers. You will be someone who says that I believe, number two, that the minority, whatever number you take, and the majority are unbelievers, you will necessarily be Shia. And the one who says they are neither Sunni nor Shia, there's something else, there may not be a label for them, but they're not Sunni. All right? Okay? Next. So I'll just stick with Sunni. Well, I'll go right. Another one. I'll give you another one for these two. You will, you, you will necessarily have to take a decision that do you believe that, okay, the Prophet Sallallahu that Sahaba, that's companion, do you believe there's another category of human being called an Imam? Do you believe in a concept of Imama? As articulated in Ibadi, Zaydi, Ismaili, Ithnashari, Shiism, all of them, is that that Imam also reveals divine and is also infallible and is the final arbiter and interpreter of what Islam is. So you must pick either you believe in this concept of Imama or you don't. If you do not believe in the concept of Imama, you are a Sunni. And if you believe in the concept of Imama, you are a Shia. Right? So even if you choose not to use these words, you say, I'm just a Muslim. You must decide on these two things. Right? If somebody says, well, I don't need to decide because I'm just going to follow the Quran. But so you do need to decide because those who imama say you can't just follow the Quran, you have to follow the imam's interpretation of Quran. So is that what you're doing? You have to decide. Right? You can't escape the decision. You understand? All right. Now let's go further within Sunni. So I gave you two reasons why you have to say. Right? Within Sunnis. Somebody says, okay, can I just be a Muslim? Do I have to decide? So, and this is now I will do it specifically for the Pakistani context. Do I have to say I'm a Dubandi or a Brailvi or a Ali Hidmat Islami or a Tanzimi Islami? So let's just take this because these are, I think, the five Wifaq boards, right? Okay? All right. Depends on a couple of things. All right? So I'll start first with the Dubandi and Brailvi. All right? So there are certain things that all the texts say that are. <coughs> different and mutually exclusive from certain things that all the Deobandi texts say. And there are many things that are common between their subject to interpretation. Is it common or is it different? Okay? So, for example, do you believe that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can be prayed to that you can say Ya Rasulullah. One is to say Ya Rasulullah out of love. Right? Some poets used to write were just in love with the Prophet and they were yearning for him and they used the word Ya to express their yearning for him. That's fine. Right? But to invoke them in prayer and to invoke the beloved Prophet in prayer, that's a different use of the word Ya. Okay? If it's acceptable to say Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the invocative form in terms of supplication and prayer whether you choose to call yourself or not it doesn't make a difference and if you think that's wrong you are the Ubandi whether you choose to call yourself or not that doesn't make a difference so that there's a series of issues right there are a series of issues like that in the realm of beliefs I'm not talking about practices right when I side is secondary beliefs so I'm not going to do the practices do you do khatam or chalisfa I'm not even going there I'm just talking about beliefs, all right? If that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had ilmul ghayb of everything, even though you grant that Allah, the one who gave him that entire knowledge of the unseen, but he had entire knowledge of the unseen, or do you believe that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had knowledge of the unseen, but you agree that whatever knowledge of the unseen he did have was given to him by Allah Ta'ala, but it was partial? If you believe that Allah Ta'ala grant him sallallahu alayhi wa complete entire knowledge of the unseen, you are brilliant. And if you believe that Allah Ta'ala granted Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa partial knowledge unseen, you are Dilbandi. Okay, let me explain on this side, Brailvi is a historical phenomenon. The answer here is actually you're just Sunni. Because even before Dilbandi is a, is a darling that was made in the 19th century, even before all the Sunnis back to the time of the Sahaba didn't believe in these things. Didn't believe his belief. So actually, the real question is, are you that Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that existed from the time of, because that term, Rabbi Tabin, up till today, because they have commonness, not just Dubmani. They all have this position on the secondary beliefs. Or are you, because they have particular positions which are unprecedented, 
They have other practices that are precedented, but these secondary beliefs are unprecedented in the past. So here you could say, can I just call myself Sunni? I say, sure. If, if, because you don't have to use the word Deobandi. Deobandi is just the name of a Darulam, right? Otherwise, in terms of belief, there's nothing additional. There's no single one secondary or tertiary bida that any Deobandi scholar added to historical Sunni beliefs prior to them. So you can take all the Sunni secondary tertiary beliefs from the time of the Sahaba, Tabi, and Tabatim all the way up to the establishment of Darulam Deoband. That's one set of beliefs. No single Deobandi's time of the formation of Darulam Deoband until today has added any single belief to that. So you can just call yourself Sunni, no problem. There are brilliant. Some of them have added some, some added some more, some added less, but there's some additional things. So that's a simple way to explain it. If you believe in any of those additional are in reality, whether you choose to use the label or not, you are brilliant. Right? Okay? So that answers that question. But, no doubt, your self-identity is just that of a Muslim. All right? I'll, uh, no doubt. Okay. That is also more of a comment. If previously... Okay, if you have friends, all of your friends are part of a broader social group and you made friends and made that group before you were inclined towards religion and now you are trying to be to religion but your friends are still the way they are, what should you do? Alright, so the first thing is you need to find a new set of friends and they can be your fellows and companions in your religious identity. Number two, you can make friendship with the old set of friends to the extent that it doesn't hamper your religious identity. And ultimately, number three, you should try to be a force of da'wah and inviting your old set of friends to also develop their own religious identity. The modernist Muslims write in their notion that Muslims have fallen behind in technology that are necessities at times such as medicine, science, etc. It's clear that as far as scientific technology, medicine goes, basically, I'll explain to you this way. You know, sometimes people say in Urdu, we want to take us 1400 years back. So we simply say this in terms of, we want to take you 1400 years back, and in terms of dunya, we want you to go even and outpace America. All right. In terms of dunya, dunya as defined as the, by the questioner, I'm taking what the questioner said, which was science and scientific research and technology. So I'm gonna, dunya can be called many other things, right? In terms of science and technology, we want you to go faster than anyone else on earth. And in terms of deen, we want to take you back 14 of you there. All right, that's it. Yeah, so somebody has written that the religious part, political parties say that, you know, through the political party uh, is the only solution. Uh, that's their position. Uh, just assume that they have sincerity and uh, try to collaborate with them on some of the earlier steps. Uh, and if they don't want to collaborate in the early, they can tell that you won't necessarily let those early steps lead into their political party, then they won't collaborate with you. That's fine. Uh, do you think humanities, uh, people in the humanities are because of wrong interpretations of Islam or because they're too heavily ingrained by secular education? It's sort of both. Uh, I would think it really depends on the individual. Uh, some of them, you know, were never properly trained Islam. Uh, if you just, for example, in Pakistan, if you go through O-levels and A-levels and then LAMs and then PhD philosophy. So what happens is in O-levels, the Gibragi heard the family LAMs can Huh? Huh? Tell <laughs> if you do, that's the last time you do all of Islamiyat is the book by Farhanda Nur Muhammad printed on the lowest grade of paper available on the market and completely black and white whereas in your all levels chemistry book you have magazine grade paper and multicolor and graphs and charts and even just the d layout and graphic design of the book message alright 
then the level of intellectual discourse, so the O-level book is not, O-level Islamiyad book, is not written at a 16-year-old level of the Islamic book, it's written at a 10-year-old level. So basically, you will do 10-year-old age level Islamiyad. Then A-levels, you will not touch Islam. There will be no subject in Islam. In a university, you will not properly study Islam. And throughout the whole PhD in philosophy program, you end up studying Islam anywhere, right? Whereas in the O level sociology and the A level sociology and the undergrad and PhD, so there's all this gap that happens, right? So obviously, I mean, they're not to blame and you should not look down on them anyway. Any human being who has such a huge gap that the knowledge of Islam has been frozen at a 10 year old level of comprehension and their knowledge of some other aspect of humanities and social science has progressed to an international standard of undergraduate or master's, even PhD level, they're obviously, which one will they find more appealing? Which one they find more personally engaging, all right? And yes, possibly, as you mentioned, they may also have uh, encountered uh, some type of reformist uh, Muslim interpretations as well, all right? Is it not the responsibility of the ulama to condemn honor killings if honor killing the name of religion uh, it is responsible of ulama to condemn honor killings whether they are performed in the name of religion or whether they are done due to some type of difference. which I think the latter is more the case but either way it's a responsibility of ulama to condemn honor killings but I also tell you that those people who are very rigidly a tribal structure they really don't care about them. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not like people think it's as easy uh, even what I told the woman, the orphan, mm -hmm. that easy. If an alim tells them that honor killing is wrong, it's not like they're going to change. It's not that easy. This is the assumption because they think it's Islamic. So as soon as they learn Islamic, they're not going to do it. They know it's not Islamic. They know acid and they, these are terrible. They know that, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a tribal culture. In these times, how do we make sure we stand up for what's right, express our stance on the matter, and also become a part of the institution and society? Again, in the last slide, uh, I offer to have on that, on what you can do. As a doctor, how can I do collaborative research? In the UK, there's, I live in the UK, there's an extensive Muslim community. I live in a white British area. I don't know where you live, but there is a center called CIM, Center of Islam and Medicine in the UK. I spoke there once, and it is beginning. It's a small network, a group of like-minded uh, doctors and a few other type of medical profession professionals who do try to get together and discuss things um, and also the interrelation between Islam and genetics and uh, psychiatry and other things All right. Taking children to secular school and focusing on their Islamic tirbiya there is a confusion in the children what is the solution for uh, you know I mean it's Strange that it's going to be basically 2019 in a few days, and we still haven't resolved this problem. You know, uh, why is it that in 2019 this issue has not yet been resolved? That there is us uh, in terms of academic, international academic standards, even one institute of O levels and A levels, and also one at the undergraduate level. Uh, so it's partly because we haven't even we haven't really finished the first slide individually and we haven't even taken on the second slide, right? Of navigating the maze of religiosity, the, those two slides. Uh, and I think really I mean strong educational institutions are going to be of these two slides, right? And maybe because people try to just establish some without work, uh, but they have made noble efforts and no doubt, uh, uh, and uh, I mean a start has been made and we're grateful to Allah Ta'ala that he's enabled at least few sets to make few sets of institutions. And it's a work in progress. But yes, uh, it, it should have happened earlier. But what does that mean then? I sit back and say that. It means that more people have to be more involved uh, in trying to catch up. Question like banking, that is off topic. And that uh, our friend Dr. Jishan Ahmed does a very good presentation on that. And at some point he will perhaps do that for his Islam Institute. And when did, how, and why did Sunnism break into various schools of thought? Uh, again, asking the question about Wabandis and Brailvis. And about Shiism, all right? So I would say that, you know, 
For Shiism, I'd rather who actually say all Shias are unbelievers. Uh, Darulam Karachi does not take that position. My own position on Shias is that I have certain beliefs and tell you that those beliefs are kufr and whether any individual Shia has them necessarily, uh, that would be for you to determine. The reason I say this is that there are a lot, unlike the Qadianis maybe, maybe many contemporary Qadianis don't know all the things I showed you yesterday, but they know the basic thing that he is a prophet. The basic thing they know. They may not have read everything he said, but they're guilty then, right? But there are some secular Shias today, be, at least the students I time in an unnamed university, <laughs> okay? All right, they used to come to me in the office hours, and I was very clear. I, I, I very, I, I got to learn very clearly. No, they don't. It was just like a community. It was more of a community thing, and there's a lot of emphasis on community actually, in the Al Khani community as well, and the Shia community as well. They truly had no idea whatsoever uh, about uh, a lot of their theological beliefs. Uh, so for them, me then to sit here and call such a person or proclaim all such be believers, I don't think, but is actually the uh, correct position in Islam. I can identify certain individual beliefs, such as one is a belief, uh, any Shia holds it, that the Quran al is not complete, and there are 10 Jews that are missing, and that the 12th Imam, who is in occultation when he comes in, the remaining 10 Jews, anybody who thinks that, uh, that is against the core beliefs that I put up for you on the slide, which is the perfection and completion of Quran, right? Example, okay? Uh, the other question was, sorry about the why and how Sunnism broke into various schools of thought, Wahhabis, Deobandis, Brailis. Okay, I think I gave a bit of an answer to Deoband, which is actually not a new school of thought. That is just the same plain Jane, Ahl Sunnah, Wal Jamaa, Sunnism that is coming. Brailvism is Deoband Reza Khan Brailvi, who added some particular beliefs. Uh, so that is the historical origin of that. And then it's his followers and the followers of his followers and people who adhere to those set of beliefs that have now even referred to themselves. Uh, as Brailvi. Wahhabism was an interesting thing. So there was a person by the name of Abdul Wahhab. He actually was a very, very pious person. Very pious person. Uh, and there was another person who happened, this, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was living at his time of the name Ibn Saud. Ibn Saud was actually not a religious scholar. Allah knows best about his piety. But Ibn Saud was a revolutionary. And he basically launched, in some cases, a very violent, and in few cases, even a very vicious uh, military struggle. Uh, but he would argue to unite the tribes of Saudi Arabia. So Allah knows best because I wasn't there, and I'm not an expert in the history, but I don't think history can always capture a person's motives, right? Now, what happened was that Abdul Wahhab was a very respected religious figure and had his own following. He was getting this political following. So they then made a pact with one another. Ibn Saud and Abdul Wahhab made a pact with one another. That we will join, and then to join forces, we will establish a state that politically will be run by the Ibn Saud family, as it is still today. But the religious affair will be given to Abdul Wahhab and his followers, as it is today. So they, they successfully executed that deal, and that deal remains till today. Uh, so that is the origin of the uh, quote unquote Wahhabi movement uh, but prior to that uh, there was for example a fellow mentioned the other day uh, Dawud al-Zahiri, Ibn Hazm Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn al-Qaim al-Jazir they were Abdul Wahhab didn't come up with anything new uh, maybe one or two sort of <coughs> maybe one or two things but mostly he was building on a very intense version uh, and a very forceful uh, version uh, of some ideas that had already been around uh, before him. Okay, all right. Okay, your old ones from day one and day two. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, they're all together, so I was very quickly, hopefully, be able to remember. Uh, the ex existence of evils. In the explanation on the existence of evil, it seems that the emphasis is on providing choice to humanity. However, when you address them and try to explain it this way, this would be very difficult because, oh, I did this. I did do this one yesterday. Uh, the second part, in Iblis. Okay, this is a very interesting question. Then why did uh, God create Satan? Why did Allah Ta'ala create Iblis? So the first answer you know, right? First answer? No, no, that it, in his perfect and infinite wisdom, he decided that the best and perfect 
for Iblis and Shaitan should exist and have his ability, which is not unlimited, which is limited of waswasa and whatever to distract humanity. So a person asked, because obviously a person would say, right, wouldn't it be such a better world if there was no Iblis and Shaitan? Okay, fine, me versus my nafs. And that you gave my nafs a chance to do good and nafs a chance to do evil. I'll be judged on the day of judgment, how successfully I fought my nafs. I got all of that. But what about this fellow? Huh? Allah Akbar. Once I did a bayan just on shaitan. Once I did that. Heavy bayan. I got <laughs> all, I couldn't even do all of them. But for, I start trying to get all the verses in the hadith on Iblis and shaitan. You couldn't put all of that in one bayan. Ajeeb bayan was that. Hmm? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think this is a good point, and I sort of, I would say this about everything I've done for the past few days. I don't have all the answers to everything. Human being has all the answers to everything. Uh, we're not liable to have the answers in our mind for everything. We are liable to follow the knowledge that has told us in the Quran and the Prophet has told us in the Sunnah, right? I could give you, I can give you very speculative answers, uh, but I don't, ha- I don't have anything that I do, uh, from a scholarship or wisdom as to why Iblis exists. I can tell you that every time, every single time in my life, every single, even one minor exception, every single time in my life, when I've had a question, such as this one, and I did the work and research, not the Islamic scholarship, I would find answers of scholarship and wisdom. And that bayan I was just trying to, the bayan I did was just a presentation of the verses on, and in that I actually did not, as part of that bayan, do any research onto the wisdom possible uh, any ways that ulama may have wisdoms in shaitan's existence but believe me if you had the ability to do the research in Arabic and perhaps there may be things in Urdu as well you would find a lot of things so I just gave you now is that Islam has been around for 1400 years they have been very capable intelligent wise scholarly people who have done a lot of research on Islam they are called ulama and they have written a lot and you will find you will find a lot of these all these discussions there, right? Uh, another big important task is for us to uh, not just me, but today's ulama to themselves research more, but to make it more uh, to all of you. All right. Uh, so there would be better answers than one I could give you. But even then, nobody could definitively claim that they have identified wisdom uh, that Allah Taala had in creating iblis and shaitan. All right. Pretty much was also done. Okay, this is uh, the last question on here. Something new. So this is a tactic that the atheists use, and that is called myth and mythology. There was a certain professor who came from America for one term at an unnamed university, and he taught a course called History as Myth. Uh, so it was Google that turned out that he was a hardcore atheist and member of some serious atheist organizations. And the whole purpose of him coming here for one term was an atheist missionary, right? And what they cleverly do in the course of history as myth is they first go back to the Aztecs and the Incans and the ancient Egyptians and Greek mythology and Rome mythology and show how that throughout human history, human beings have believed in gods or religions or or beliefs that all turned out to be myth. And in the last two sessions, I'll talk about Islam. And what's hard for the student to do then is to think that if all throughout humanity this has happened, and that Jesus being God is also a myth. I mean, they'll teach Christianity in a particular way also. So then what, you're, what they're trying to, to accept is what's called exceptionalism, Islamic exceptionalism, that of all, every single religion, creed, and belief is a myth, and only Islam is, right? So the first answer to this is this is itself a fallacy because Islam doesn't teach that. Islam teaches that there have been so many prophets, who are prophets, and there were so many religions that were true religions. So Islam doesn't say that everything in history was false and myth and mythology and only Islam is true. Deception. Secondly, yes, there is a kind of Islamic exceptionalism and we 100% own and embrace that. And that is that unlike all the 120,000 plus previous prophets and X number of Allah knows best previous deen, religion and scriptures, only Islam is will not be 
at least in its in Quran the form will not be tainted or corrupted and altered right that is an exception all right uh, so atheists have a lot of things like about myth then they'll talk about superstition magic all right and can be reduced to cognitive belief religious experience can be reduced to cognitive factors or social factors opium of the masses there's so many things Oh, okay, this is a good question, but yeah. If we consistently apply that principality is not infallible and has a margin of error and therefore is incapable at arriving at absolute knowledge and wisdom, why are humans expecting that very same rationality to arrive at faith, religion, Islam with certainty? So if you remember yesterday, I said that I said this repeatedly. It can only take you so far. It's going to be akal, fitra, and ruh. There is no claim in Islam that akal alone can take you all the way. Quran, human beings and unbelievers in fact were asked to use their akal and tafakkur because it can take you part of the way, but it won't take you all the way. All right? This was not really done. Okay, so in uh, how much room is there for quote unquote skepticism in the sense that skepticism is science, all right? Uh, a scientist or a science student is initially skeptical of something that they're researching. Uh, they're not skeptical of something except as fact, all right? So similarly, in religion, those things like the core beliefs that the religion establishes with certainty, there is no role at all about them, all right? But if there's something that is undetermined, unsettled, not part of the primary core beliefs or practices, uh, they begin as a skeptic in the sense that they want to have an open mind and they want to do investigative research to learn what the scholarly position is, that is fine. And Homosexuality and L. G L G B Q T is how I also get the letters sometimes wrong. Uh, okay, I'll make a few. I mean, this is a you know, as Allah wills, we will end it on this topic. But uh, a few points I want to make to you. Number one, that homosexuality, of the, the different kinds. Uh, is definitely and irrevocably a sin in Islam. It is not an act. It is a sin. It is no more and no less than a sin. It is no more and no less than heterosexual. Right? Uh, in terms of this, the second part is saying about the urges and inclinations in a person. So all of the same that would be given to a person that they have to Curb, control, limit, not act upon the heterosexual, uh, lustful urge, but that other than nikah, right? The same thing would be said to the homosexual urge. There's no claim in Islam uh, that this doesn't happen. There's no denial of Islam. It's mentioned in Quran al Karim, so that it's known and understood that this is something that can be a sinful urge that occurs in people. Not to say there is no sinful urge that Islam says is genetically predetermined and you can't escape it. So this argument that I was genetically, when we say Islam transcends genetics, because if somebody says I'm genetically a murderer, I can't escape it, are you gonna let him keep murdering? No. It says I'm genetically angry, I'll keep uh, beating up someone, we won't accept it. So it's not just about this. There's no sin. Islamic understanding of the composition of a human being is that they're genetically doomed and predetermined to do something. Yes, they need tazkiyah, they need tarbiyah, jihad against their nafs, right? And they can overcome. Okay, Western psychology, other than this issue, also accepts that. Western psychology will say, if you're angry, ang counsel, anger management counseling, you'll be rid. Western psychology says you have an addiction, we'll put you through rehabilitation, we'll rid you of addiction. Western psychology, exfilitation, transformation, corrective, correction for everything except for this. So how is it scientifically established that this alone is genetic? 
behavioral, all of it is genetic, or none of it is. There's no scientific basis for which you can say that this is genetic and the rest isn't, and therefore we have rehab for everything, and there's no rehab for this. You understand? All right? So this is, a, this is a, unfortunately, this is a very big, okay. Initially, I mean, I can tell you the American, when we were going up in America, uh, the people who were like that, uh, they did not initially make this claim that they're genetic. In fact, they would be insulted. They would say, it's my choice. It's my orientation. They would not accept this, that it, I'm genetically programmed. Now, I've seen a change. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't follow that particular, I don't know so much. But I definitely can tell you now in America, there's a much more of a shift towards this. That it's not my choice orientation, it's how I am, right? Uh, how exactly they've made that change, I don't know. Uh, but. I'm telling you it is a choice and it's a matter of orientation, right? Uh, okay, and they're, they're not unbeliever. They uh, be still loved like every other sinning believer. They should be loved like every sinning believer. They should be helped and guided like every sinning believer. They should have full participation in everything that the Muslim community does like any and every other sinning believer. They should continue to pray salah and try to do all virtuous deeds and good acts like any and every sinning believer. There's, n there's nothing special, unique, different about this. It is not an exceptional case like the West tries to make it. All right? That, that's the co uh, key comments that I want to make on that. All right, let me just do one more. Uh, Okay, Jalla, why don't I do this? The concept of kashf and ilham as the 40th part of Prabhupada considered open by Sufiya. There are many prana paga ke kaun Sufiya or kaun Sufiya nahi hai. Ye bhi bada pechida cheez bhi hai vaisa. There are many such stories quoted in Fazal Amal that some wali had ilham. How does this go along with core belief? What is the right concept? Should we use or not use the word ilham for this? Or call it fourth or forty part of prophet. Okay, the first thing is that the word ilham is not used in that hadith. It's dreams, true dream. A true dream contains a hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Is the one aspect not of nabuwa that you will become one fortieth of a prophet if you get a true dream. Is one form of communication that Allah taala used to communicate revelation to anbiya that Allah Ta'ala will still use but not revelation to a non-Nabi but to have inspiration. Now, in technical usage, wahi means scriptural revelation and ilham means non-scriptural inspiration. Alright? So, for example, uh, in a linguist, when you make istikhara, you're asking for Allah Ta'ala to do ilham on your heart as to what is the right decision for you. Okay? Some people may receive a dream about that as well. And the dream may be separate from an istikhara. That can happen separately. All right? Uh, that is the meaning. Uh, ilham, however, even the greatest waliullah, whoever you may think that is, after the sahaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sahaba, third darja is the awliya. Within that, the awliya of the tabin, the tabai tabin, and then afterwards, awliya. Take an those awliyaullah may have been ulama, mufassirun, muhaddisun, may have been ordinary people, unknown people somewhere. We may not know who they are. Whoever you may think after the Sahaba, whoever hypothetically is the greatest wali of Allah after the Sahaba, any and every ilham of his or her is dhanni. Then it means it is fallible possibility of error. It is not definitively true. Therefore, because the question asked about beliefs, an ilham of a wali cannot in any way whatsoever lead to any kind of belief, aqidah, nor can it ever touch or change the core beliefs, because this is the, the question that they've asked. All right? Now, as far as those stories quoted in Fazail, as well, he had ex ilham, those are stories. Uh, they may have happened, they may not have happened. You're free to take them or leave them as you wish. There's, there's nothing binding in those stories. They do not constitute necessary knowledge. 
But what you should know, if you choose to accept those stories, is that any ilham that any wali received, he would have only understood it, he or she, would have understood it to the best of his or her ability, number one. Number two, it could be, it could have, the interpretation may have been wrong. But number three, they can never ever interpret and understand and then practice. They think they understood from the ilham in a way that is contrary to sharia. That's not allowed. But if there's something that's permissible within sharia and they feel they got an ilham about it, fine, right? So they got an ilham, I want to buy the Honda as opposed to Toyota. That's the type of ilham you people get, right? Yeah, fine, because both are permissible. But if they get any kind of ilham suggesting to do anything that is contrary to sharia, that itself is a sign of fallibility. It's guaranteed to be wrong. So ilham is only operational in the permissible. I give you an example of that in scholars. You know, uh, some of the muhaddithin, about some of them, you do get some reports that there was a very complicated narration of hadith and they wondered authentic or not. First, they used all of the skills and knowledge of hadith scholarship, but still there was some uncertainty and they felt that they got an ilhart and that inclined them to the position that it is more certain. Fine, right? Because that was permissible in the Sharia. Once you did your research, then your vision, you write to the best of your ability either way, that's permissible in the Sharia. And if you felt you got some inspiration in your heart that helped you, that's fine. All right? The last thing is that the ilham of any wali, even if it is, if it fits the above criteria, and let's say even if it was properly understood, theoretically, let's say we just say it's properly understood, and it's obviously permissible in Sharia, it's still not binding on anyone else. You are free to reject in any ilham of any wali if you so wish. All right? I think that. Is that it or do we, we have to go? Bakhud that one, alhamdulillah.